that tonight as we open up God's word to see what it is he wants to say to us. Go ahead, open up your Bibles to the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 5. Some of you have already turned to Ephesians, but we're going to not be in Ephesians tonight. We're going to be in the book of Joshua. You know, today was one of those days for me where you just keep wondering, God, what else is going to happen? What else is going to happen? What, what more could go wrong? Let me, let me fill you in on, on part of my day. Um, we made 93 gorgeous, beautiful white chocolate scones for the ladies' tea this weekend. There's only four left, okay, so get there early. Uh, but in, in, in the process of, of cooking in the kitchen, uh, we managed to break the sink, the garbage disposal, and flooded the whole kitchen. And, and then um, I had them turn on the wrong oven, and when we turned on the wrong oven, we created a fire so big, we had to run and find a fire extinguisher to put it out. And so I feel like I've lived the pages of the Old Testament today. I was expecting Noah to show up and ask me to hop on his ark during the flood, and I felt like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the flames were bursting out of the oven, and uh, we were screaming, and got... Uh, got it put out with the fire extinguisher. So funny that someone would come up to me uh, about 10 minutes and go and say, I don't know why, but the Lord put you on my heart today. <laughs> and I said, it's probably because I almost died 20 times. Uh, and uh, she said, I've been praying for you. I, I believe that regardless of what your day was like, whether you set your kitchen on fire or flooded it, and whether you just narrowly got here with your life, um, God has something he wants to speak to us. So tonight, we're going to have our Bible study in one of the most exciting, action-packed books of the Bible. It's the sixth book in the Old Testament. It's the, the book right after the Pentateuch. And the book of Joshua chronicles the events surrounding the people of God advancing into and occupying the promised land that God had promised to them, had promised to Abraham. And, and we see this sort of story unfold throughout the pages of the Old Testament. And now here they are in the book of Joshua, and they're ready to take God's promised land to them. We've spent a lot of time on Wednesday nights in Paul's epistles. Over the last year, we've, we've covered books like Philippians and Ephesians. And, and just before that, last summer, we, we worked through some of Paul's letters to Timothy. And, and we spent a lot of time in those books on Sunday mornings. Pastor Chuck has been working through the book of Acts. And we've been looking at God's working and moving post the resurrection. Now, after Jesus came, after he lived, he died and he, he rose again. We've been looking at a lot of scripture that has to do with, well, what happened to the church after that? Well, what happens to us? How are we supposed to live? But the majority of the Bible, 39 books of the 66 books in the Bible, tell the story of God and tell the story of humanity pre-resurrection. Before Jesus enters the scene, born as a baby in Bethlehem, we have all of these pages, all of these books, all of these chapters that talk about God's interaction with humanity. It's important for us to understand that as we read the Old Testament, it serves one major focus. It serves one major point, and it's a funnel that points everything towards Jesus. So as we look at Joshua chapter 5 tonight, we're going to look at how God leads his people into the promised land, and then we're going to draw parallels to our own lives as we follow Jesus post-resurrection into the promised land of salvation and the promised land of redemption. And what we've got to understand is that as Christians, Jesus didn't come to the earth to die on the cross just to make bad people good. Jesus came, he, he died on the cross, he rose from the grave to make dead people alive. I mean, that's why Jesus, that's why he came. Jesus said he didn't just come to give life, but he came to give life abundantly, a, a, a new life, the kind of life that God intended for us to have. And there is a promised land for us to move into. There's a promised land for us to take. There's a promised land for us to live in post-resurrection. It's not a physical location, although I, I wish it was. I wish there was somewhere in Scripture where God said, hey, if you follow Jesus, move to Maui and, and get, a, get a little place by the beach and just kick out. I mean, that'd be so cool, right? But there's not a physical place we're supposed to move. 
but he's asking us to live with promised land hearts. He, he's asking us to live with promised land peace and promised land joy and promised land conviction and promised land action and, and promised land contentment. So, so, so we're going to be in Joshua chapter 5 tonight. And what I want to do is just a really brief overview of what's happened with the people of God in Joshua chapters 1 and 4 so that when we get to Joshua chapter 5, it makes sense to us. So you could turn back to Joshua chapter 1 as I just kind of go over these, but what happens in Joshua chapter 1 is we kind of have this new era for the people of God. Moses, their fearless leader, who went uh, to Pharaoh and said, hey, let my people go, and we have that exchange with all the miracles. He leads God's people, Moses leads God's people out of slavery into the wilderness, and they're just about ready to take the promised land. They send 12 spies. Ten of the spies come back and say, hey, there's absolutely no way this is going to work. God must be crazy. There's no way. Have you seen the giants? Have you seen the obstacles? Have you seen the problems? Only two of those spies come back with belief in their heart. The, the people of God weren't ready for the promised land. So God says, hey, I'm going to have you stay in the wilderness for 40 years. And at the end of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 4, it's the end of that 40 years. And, and in that last chapter, Moses, fearless leader, he dies. And Deuteronomy 34 says that there has never been another man like Moses, for he knew the Lord face to face. And what a cool thing to be said about something. What a cool thing to have on your gravestone. Never has there been a man like this. He knew the Lord face to face. Joshua 1 the people are without a leader, and God says, Joshua, it's you. You've lived in the shadow of Moses. You've served him faithfully. You've studied. You love God. You're the man. You step up, and you lead these people into the place that I have prepared for them. So after 40 years of wandering the wilderness, the people of God, around 4 million of them at this point, are now waiting on the bank of the Jordan River looking across the river, looking at the promised land that they've been thinking about for the last 40 years. God has a conversation with Joshua, the very beginning of Joshua chapter 1. And three times as he's talking to Joshua, he says, hey, Joshua, I want you to be strong and I want you to be courageous. And after each time the Lord tells Joshua to be strong and courageous, he gives Joshua a reason. He doesn't say, hey, Joshua, you know, muster up this courage, muster up this strength uh, on your own. You got to get it. You got to get jacked up. He says, no, I want you to be strong and courageous. And he gives them three reasons. Hey, I've promised this to you. And what I promise, I always come through on. He, he says, I'm going to be with you. I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. And he said, I've given you instructions. I've given you the law. I've, give, I've given you my word. Do not turn from it to the left. Do not turn from the right. Keep it always on your lips. Meditate on it, all these things. And then Gen Joshua then warns the people they have three days to prepare themselves to cross the Jordan River into the Promised Land, chapter 1. Now we go to chapter 2. And in chapter 2, we have this really interesting part of the story where Joshua sends three spies into the land to kind of survey it, to check it out. They end up in the city called Jericho. And while they're there, someone tips off the king and the authorities that these spies, uh, these Israelite spies are here. And so they go searching for him. And these three men run into Rahab, the prostitute. And she has this really cool interaction where she begins to say that, hey, I, I believe in this God that you serve. I've seen him work, I've heard the stories, I believe he's real, I believe he's legit. And she hides the three spies so their lives are spared. They have this conversation, they say, hey, we're going to spare your life when we come back. Hang, hang a scarlet uh, tassel or rope or whatever from your window. When we come back and see it, you and your family will be spared. Chapter 2. In chapter 3, Joshua then says, hey, people, prepare to cross the river. Now, I just want you to... Let your mind go here for a second. Put yourself in the story and, and see what's on happening. Four million people and all their possessions, all their livestock, all their children, all their valuables, all their belongings have to cross a river that's being fed by spring rains and its banks are overflowing and the waters are rushing. To put this in perspective, think of the Coachella Valley at its busiest time during our season. Think of all the festivals, let's say Coachella and Stagecoach and what else happens? The tennis tournament and the polo, they were all happening at once. Pretend it's our busiest time of year. Take the, the, to the total population.
population of the Coachella Valley at its busiest time of the year, times it by six, tell all of those people, grab everything you need to relocate, meet us at Date Palm in the 10 freeway. And instead of the freeway, it's a river, a rushing river, whitewater rafting, okay, without the raft. Four million people, cows, goats, pigeons, everything they need for sacrifice, it's, it's here. Meet me at Date Palm in the 10, we're going to march to Monterey. Crazy. <laughs> this, is, this is nuts, people. This is, this is crazy. And Joshua says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take our priests, we're going to take the Ark of the Covenant, the visible representation of God's presence with us. Go ahead of us, carry it, get your feet wet, stand in the river. I hope you see that when Moses came, he parted it before they walked. And Joshua says, get your feet wet, go in there. And the priests go in with the Ark of the Covenant. The waters back up so the people walk through on dry land. Chapter 4. It's a chapter of worship. The people set up stones of remembrance and they worship the Lord for the miracle he just provided. So we're going to pick up the narrative tonight in Joshua chapter 5. And as I was reading, as I was studying this chapter, I, I divided it into six different parts. I see these six different distinct events happen in chapter five. And, and I think they're divided for a reason. And I think it's a great place for us to stop, to reflect, and to apply the truth of the text to our own lives in those areas. So we're going to begin in Joshua chapter five and read, uh, start at verse one. Can we pray before we do that? Lord, I am beyond excited to hear from you tonight. I need it. Desperate to hear from you tonight. I pray we, we wouldn't look at these words just as a historical, factual, textbook but Jesus we would begin to see where you enter the scene here God your plan to redeem your people to bring the totality of who we are before you tonight God surrendering and humbling ourselves before you I want to receive from you tonight Joshua chapter 5, verse 1, as soon as all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over. If you're an underliner, note taker, highlighter, writer downer, uh, put these words down. Their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. So I told you I divided this chapter into six different parts. And the first part of chapter five that I see here is kind of what happens immediately after the Jordan crossing. The Lord has just turned this incredible obstacle standing in front of God's people into an opportunity for people to worship him and to validate his calling on Joshua to lead God's people. And now the people of God, they're on the right side of the river, their feet just barely in the promised land. And what waits for them, what's waiting for them is all the enemies and all the adversaries that scared the first 12 spies in the book of Numbers. Those things didn't just go away. 40 years of waiting, they didn't just vanish. They're still there. God hadn't taken them away, and they were still a very real obstacle for God's people to overcome. But something in this narrative has changed for the people of God. Something had changed since the people had crossed over the river. Check out what verse 1 says. It, soon, it says, as soon as all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over, their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. 
And so the enemies of the people of God who, have, who had caused the people so much fear, had caused the people of God so much fear that they didn't take the promised land 40 years earlier, are now shaking and trembling in the shadow of the Israelites. It says their hearts melted. There was no spirit in them. What changed in the narrative? What changed for the people of God here? And what changed was the power of God was on display for all to see. And here's kind of our big takeaway from this first part. The obedience of the Israelites served as a platform for God to showcase his strength and to showcase his might. And I think someone other than me, because I sure need to hear this tonight. I think someone else needs to hear this tonight too. When we have uninhibited obedience, when we come to God and we say, man, that river looks crazy, and I don't know how I'm going to get across it, but you said move, and the priests are there, and their feet are wet, and you didn't part it like you did for Moses, but they're still there, and I don't know how this is going to work, but, but God, if you said move, I'm going to move. When we have uninhibited obedience, our spiritual enemy shakes with fear. When we walk in the plan and we walk in the purposes of God, nothing can stand against us because we walk with the strength and we walk with the power of God himself. And, and, and we may forget, but our spiritual enemy always remembers that if God is for us, who can be against us? It's Romans 8, 31. No one. It's not a fair fight. Sometimes we watch these Marvel movies and we get so into it because we just don't know if the good guys are going to win and it seems so close and, and so many times the, the good guys are losing and it comes to the very, man, that's not how it works with God and our enemy Satan. God is, he has won. He is victorious. And when we have uninhibited obedience to God, our spiritual enemy shakes with fear because God has already won. And he knows that when we are really trusting God, his defeat is assured. I love that the scripture says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And so the big truth we pull from this part of the text is our obedience to God serves as a platform for God to showcase his strength and his might in our lives. Here's what's cool about this part of the story. The Israelites certainly didn't split the waters of the river. It, it, it wasn't the priests who went in and were like, whoosh. No, it was God. God moved. God did it. All they had to do was walk where he told them to go. As a, as a pastor, I get asked a certain question all the time, and it's always phrased a little differently, but this is kind of the culmination of the question. People come up and say, hey, why don't I see God moving in my life? Why don't I see him moving? Why don't I? Why don't I feel him moving? Why don't I hear him speaking to me? Why doesn't it seem like he's working in my life like he used to when I first came to the Lord or I first started living for him or I first started walking in the truths of the Bible? What happened? And the answer just might be that they're still standing in the spotlight. Church, we have to let our obedience be a platform, not for us to stand in, but for God to move in, for him to be the Lord, for him to be on the throne, so that when we obey, he moves, and he works miracles, and he does wonders. But in that, there's this warning embedded. When God moves and acts, there's always a decision to make. When I, when I have uninhibited obedience to God and he shows up and he moves, I have a decision to make. Do I let myself receive worship or do I turn and worship the Lord? It's, it's not me that split the rushing waters, it's God. And I just simply walked where he moves. So when, the, when, when, when God moves and people notice, they might not see God. The end of verse 1 says their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. The enemy saw what God did, but they shook in fear because of the people of Israel. See, when God moves and God works, they may not see God. They may only see the person walking. 
It's important that we acknowledge that those are God moments. And we take the time to direct worship and we take the time to direct praise towards him, just like the Israelites did in chapter four immediately after crossing. The end of chapter four says, hey, we've done this. So the generations following us will know that God is who he says he is and he'll do what he says he's gonna do. Then we get to the second portion of chapter five. It's, it's after they've crossed. It's after we hear that the people, their enemies are shaken with fear. And, and, and the second portion is this circumcision of the people. Check out verse two. It says, at the time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at this really, really difficult name. I can't say, but some of you might be able to. Verse four says, and this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them, all the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who came out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. This is what God's saying. When the people of God lived in captivity and slavery to Egypt, they circumcised their males. But when they left Egypt and they went into the wilderness, every male that was born after that time, every male that was born into uh, the people of God while they're in the wilderness had not been circumcised yet. So verse 6 says, For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation... The men of war who came out of Egypt perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. That's why we see Moses, he dies in 34. That that previous generation who didn't believe God for the promise, they've all died. So the Lord swore to them that he would not let them see the land that the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give to us a land flowing with milk and honey. So it was their children whom he raised up in their place that Joshua circumcised. For they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. During the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, none of the sons born during that time had been circumcised. And at this point in the story, the first generation of men who fled Egypt are all dead. And Joshua now instructs the men to be circumcised, to circumcise the next generation. Disclaimer, okay? These parts of scriptures can be really weird and really bizarre if we don't understand what's happening. Like what a terrible day to be an Israelite man, okay? Like victory is ours, you're gonna do what? But when we look at what's happening and the meaning and the significance, it kind of takes on this new meaning. So so why circumcision is the question. Circumcision was a, a powerful act of consecration to God for the Israelites. In it, an Israelite said, I'm not like the other nations. I'm not like the other people. I listen to God. I I do what the true God says I should do. And it was this very real and very special act of stepping out in faithful obedience and identifying yourself as one of the Lord's people. It was renouncing the, the flesh and the world. It was dying to self and living for this God who had called them his people. And this was the imagery and and significance in the circumcision. And and now God asked this next generation of men, now about to take the promised land, to be circumcised. And this circumcision was a powerful sign. The the scripture says it, that God had raised up a, a new generation of faith. The previous generation stopped short of obedience and they were prevented from entering the promised land. But this generation would be the generation that God would work through mightily. As I'm reading this and I'm studying it, I I, I had this thought, if ever there was a time our world desperately needed a generation marked by audacious obedience to God and a bold, audacious faith, it's now. Man, we need it now. Our world needs people who actually do what Scripture says. And this is coming from a guy who watched the previous generation. 
<laughs> do incredible things for the Lord. Well, my great aunt chose to be a missionary and there was no FaceTime. Sandy and Tom are in Uganda and at least every other day, Adam gets to look at them and say, hi, Nani, I miss you. And, and Nani gets to tell her what's happening, but, but my great aunt went, never knowing if she would return in maybe a letter or two a year, and, and eventually her life was taken because she was proclaiming the good news of Jesus. And we've watched this generation live in a way with a faith that is just incredible. And now we come here, and I watch my generation, and man, it is time for us to step up and have an audacious, bold faith. That's something you can pray for as we meet on Monday nights. We had 20, 25, 30 knuckleheads over there every Monday night, 18 to 30 year old, wondering what God has to do with them. Would you pray? They just grabs their heart and they want to serve him with everything they've got. Man, we need it. We need it. The good news for us tonight is that living on this side of the resurrection we don't need to have this mass public circumcision, Whew. right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. But what we can have and what we need is what the Apostle Paul writes all the time. We have a circumcision of the heart. Where we come to God and we say, hey, God, I'm yours. What you asked me to do, I'm actually going to do, and I'm going to put away the things of the flesh. I'm, I'm not going to do the things everybody else is doing because it's what they do, but I'm going to set myself apart for you. I'm going to live for you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do what you ask me to do. Those are the first two sections. We get to this third section, and, and it's the section where God rolls away the reproach of Egypt. Let's read verse 8 together. It says, when the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said to Joshua, underline this, highlight it, write it down. Today, I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. What does it mean when God says that he rolled away the reproach of Egypt? The word reproach means a deep expression of disapproval or disappointment. Think of what life was like for the Israelites after Joseph to this point. It enslaved, humiliated, and finally when they're free, to wander for 40 years because they couldn't double down on the promise. For the Israelites, there was this lingering shame, this lingering dishonor that hung over their heads, and it stemmed from their shame in Egypt, the shame of their degrading slavery. The Israelites still carried the identity of slaves and of wanderers. And with those words, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. God is giving them a new identity. He is giving them a new banner to march under. They are no longer slaves. They are victorious children of God. And the question I have for you is what banner do you march under tonight? What identity do you give yourself? Are you, are you living as a slave? Are you living as a wanderer? Do you feel this overwhelming sense of guilt and shame for the things you've done and the places you've been? Or have you let God roll away the reproach in your life? I won't, names aren't important in this story, although it's very, very true. Someone very close to me found themselves in the throes of addiction. And I went to a number of meetings with them after withdrawals and really dark places. And uh, we went to N.A. I remember sitting there and um, we went around the table. Everybody had to introduce themselves. Hey, I'm Bill. 
I'm an addict. Hey, I'm Steve. I'm an addict. And I watched this person who had always been a hero of mine stand up and just with shame and dishonor say, my name is so-and-so and I'm an addict. And God used that group, he, he used that group and people in that group to, to bring healing and, and good things, but I'll never forget the day when that person came to me. And they said, I found a new support group at my church. And he said, I sat there and everybody went around the circle and they said, hey, my name is, and I'm forgiven. I used to be but now Christ has made me new. And there was this joy to see him say, I used to be this, but God has now given me new identity. You know, God wants to do the same thing in your life. He wants to roll away the reproach, roll away the shame, roll away the guilt in your life, and give you a new identity. You are no longer a slave. You are free. You are a child of God. Man, I hope somebody gets excited about that tonight. <laughs> Is there anything better, people? Come on. The world wants to know you by what you did and who you were. God knows you by his son and what his son can do in your life. We sing that in worship. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. We get to the fourth section where Passover is celebrated. Look at verse 10. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. One verse, easy to skip over. Let's not skip over it because there is power in remembrance. During the Passover celebration, the people of God are called to remembrance their deliverance from Egypt. They were free and a delivered people because of what God had done for them. It's just so important. And I believe that celebrating the Passover right after God had rolled away the reproach and rolled away the shame of Egypt is vitally important for the people of God and so important for us to take notice of tonight. Because God didn't roll away the reproach of Egypt and give the people a new identity because anything that they had done, he did it, he moved, he worked, and this is all about God. And shame on me for thinking that I have somehow earned, I have somehow deserved God's favor, blessing, forgiveness, or grace. You see, the story of Joshua isn't about Joshua. The story of Joshua isn't about the people of God. The story of Joshua is about God and his dealings with people. The story of Noah isn't about Noah. The story of Noah is about God. And the story of my life and the story of your life should be about God. And in the same way as the Israelites were in remembrance of what God has done, we are to be in constant remembrance of our redemption at Calvary. And our lives should be lived in the shadow of the cross. The fifth portion of this is found in verse 11. The people eat the produce of the land. This is what it says. And the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Finally, the people of God are in the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. And there is provision in the promise. And that's true for you tonight. God didn't call you to follow him to starve. But he called you to follow him to feast on the fruits of promised land living. 
See, so many times we think that this walk with Jesus and following God is about all the things I can't do, all the things I have to give up, and look what everybody else gets, and now I sit here with nothing, I don't get to have any fun. Guess what? God didn't call us in the promised land to starve because there's joy in the promised land. And there's life in the promised land. And there's satisfaction in the promised land. And there's contentment in the promised land, right? If you're starving while you're following Jesus, it's because you're not opening your mouth to eat the goodness of who he is in his word and, and bathing yourself in worship and walking in the spirit and experiencing the fruits of the spirit. If you're starving in this promised land, it's because you're not eating in the promised land. And now the people eat Finally, they're not eating that manna anymore. And they see what God had for them the whole time. And the sixth and final part of this chapter is my favorite. I've left the most time for the last part. Let's continue reading Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand, and Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us, or are you for our adversaries? And he said, no. This feels awkward to me. And Joshua asks, are you for us, or are you against us? And the man responds, no. This didn't really answer the question. Joshua was asking. I mean, imagine showing up at a Super Bowl party where your team is playing and you are out of your mind excited. So I've got all my Vikings gear on, right? I've got the horns. I've got the purple pride, right? This is our year. We've been four times. We've lost every time. This is year the Vikings are going to whoop the, the, the Los Angeles Chargers. What a joke. Sorry. And I show up to the party and I, I've got my horn. It's like, ooh. Right? And I sit down next to my friend and I say, who are you cheering for? And they look at me and they say, no. <laughs> they didn't really answer my question, did they? And this is what happens to Joshua. The answer he gets is really for the question he should have been asking. And the question shouldn't have been if the Lord was on Joshua's side. As you say, you know, my side or on their side, you've got a sword, you look ready to fight. I want to make sure you're fighting for me and not against me. The right question, the proper question, was if Joshua was on the Lord's side. When I read this, it was a spiritual kick in the gut for me. What a profoundly life-changing truth. It's not really about whether God is for us or against us. It's really about us being for the things of God. See, God doesn't need to align himself with us. Is in, inf in his infinite goodness, in infinite wisdom, God doesn't ever need to align himself with me, but we need to align ourselves with God. And this is so vitally important for us as we live a life of faith in Jesus. Jesus has called us out of spiritual bankruptcy into the promised land of salvation and freedom. And then he empowers us with this gift of the Holy Spirit to live victoriously and supernaturally so that we can live great commission lives. He's called us, he's redeemed us, he's made us new. He left, he gave us the gift of the Spirit, and he said, now you go and finish what I started. And so many times I find myself after a while grasping and longing and stretching for control, making my own plans, doing my own thing, moving away from dependency on Christ. And then I say, God bless me. God walk with me. God fight for me. And without verbalizing it, it's as if I'm looking at God and saying, hey, God, here's the plan. I want this. I'm going to do this. I want everything to be exactly how I want it. Is that cool? All right, let's do this, God. And after that fails, and for me, it always does. After that fails, saying, God, here's what I want to do. Come on along with me. I spend way too much time asking, hey, God, are you really for me? Are you really involved in my life? Do you really care for me? Why don't I feel it? Why don't I see more things going well for me? You see, it's not really about whether God is pulled to my side. It's really about being for the things of God. 
And God doesn't need to align himself with us. We need to constantly align or realign ourselves with God. Now, I'm not saying that this is the attitude that I think Joshua has. I'm not projecting that onto him. I'm saying that that was a kick in the gut for me. In fact, I think Joshua, more than anything, feels overwhelmed and probably a little fearful while he's looking at the city of Jericho. We've taken... Joshua stands in the shadow of Jericho. And it was just days ago that God tells Joshua three times to not fear and be courageous. While the rest of the people are celebrating the river crossing, celebrating the Passover, enjoying the fruits of the land, Joshua is looking forward to the next obstacle with the weight of an entire nation resting on his shoulders. And in the shadow of Jericho, he stands taking in the gravity of the path set before him. Those people were giants. They were physically stronger. Their walls were impenetrable. And Joshua, having been one of those 12 spies that surveyed the land 40 years ago, knew better than anyone else what they were up against. And I just want to, I, I want to stop the Bible study. I want to stop the, the preaching for a moment and just ask you a question. What do you think was running through Joshua's mind in that moment? Don't raise your hand. Don't answer. Just ask yourself. The people behind him are celebrating. He's now here. He sees Jericho. There's a man with a sword in front of him. What do you think is running through his mind at that moment? We don't really know. But I wonder if Joshua is thinking about the obstacle or if Joshua is thinking about the promise. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I wonder if Joshua was thinking about his opponent's strength in Jericho's army, or was he thinking about what God told him in chapter one, verse five, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. I wonder if Joshua was thinking about how he could possibly do this by himself without Moses. How could he lead the people through such enormous difficulties? Or was he thinking about what God told him in chapter 1, verse 9? Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you for wherever you go. And in this exchange, here's where I'm going, in this exchange between Joshua and the man wielding the sword, we see that the battle that lies ahead of Joshua isn't a battle of strength, but really is a battle of faith. What's faith? Faith is the trust in the trustworthiness of God. Faith is believing and acting upon the conviction that God is who he says he is and he'll do what he says he'll do. And that's why I love that new worship song we've been singing that Scott did tonight. You remember what we sang? You are who you say you are. And you'll do what you'll say you'll do. Woo! You've been who you've always been to us. This we know. We'll see the enemy run. We'll see the victory run. One, we hold on to every promise you've ever made because Jesus, you are unfailing. It's a song of victory. It's an anthem, anthem of faith. And we sing the words of this text. We sing the story of the people of God when we say, God, I believe you are who you say you are. And I believe you'll do what you say you're going to do. And so Joshua looks ahead at a battle that isn't going to be won with strength, but is going to be won with faith. What does that have to do with us? Sometimes the battles we face and the things God asks us to do seem like they need to be fought with strength when the Lord is really asking us for an increase of faith. This is what the Bible says faith does for us. Faith doesn't fixate on the difficulties, but looks to the Lord. Faith believes more in the promises of God to help than in the power of Satan to hinder. Faith will give comfort in the midst of fears, where unbelief will bring fear in the midst of comfort. Faith makes great burdens light. Unbelief makes light burdens unbearably heavy. 
Faith lifts us up when we are down. Unbelief casts us down when we are up. Faith brings peace and comfort to our souls. Unbelief brings restlessness. Faith brings assurance. Unbelief brings fear. I want to ask you, to just step outside yourself for a moment and look at the person you are from the outside and the the minute details of your life that no one else knows but you do because you go to sleep thinking about them and you wake up thinking about them and you carry them by yourself and you, you feel crushed under the weight of it. I just want you to step outside of that for a moment. Ask the Spirit to speak to you because I want to ask you to bring your battles. I want to ask you to bring your difficulties. I want to ask you to bring your worries and your fears before the Lord tonight and let them be drenched in faith. Soak in the, the promises of God. Ask him to exchange the lenses of fear for lenses of faith and look forward, not with anxiety, but peace, knowing that when we align ourselves with God, he will carry you through. You don't have to muscle your way through this. You don't have to fight your way through this. But you can actually rest in faith. And I have to believe that every one of us, we carry something that we need to bring to the Lord and say, God, I haven't been believing you for this and in this, and I've taken my eyes off of you and I've put them on the obstacle. God, I want to look forward at this with you. I want you to make it personal. I just want you to stop right now and bring that thing before the Lord. What is your Jericho? What battle have you lived in fear of? What has God asked you to do but you stand paralyzed? in fear. Verse 13 says, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us? Are you for our adversaries? And he said, no. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy and Joshua did so. Does that make you recall any other parts of Scripture? If you're engaging mentally, if you're really thinking about what's happening in the text, this has to raise a question for the reader. And the question that comes to my mind is, who, who is this? Who is standing before Joshua. He identifies himself as the commander of the army of the Lord, but who is that really? So there's a theological term I want us to learn tonight together, and I don't do that often, and I don't do that to impress you or so that you can go and you can tweet it and Facebook it and impress your friends. And fa In fact, learning fancy schmancy words doesn't earn you a better mansion in heaven and probably won't help you lead any of your friends to the Lord, but it might help you understand this part of scripture better. And the word is theophany. T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-Y, theophany. And a theophany is a visible manifestation of God to humankind. And right here in the pages of the Old Testament, pre-resurrection, we see one of the many theophanies in the Old Testament. This is clearly a manifestation of God through the person of Jesus. Jesus 
has entered the Old Testament narrative and stands before Joshua. And here's how we know that this is Jesus standing before Joshua. I wouldn't want you to believe that without proof, so here's how we know. I'll give you three reasons. Though the title commander of the army of the Lord could perhaps apply to an angel such as Michael, Joshua's falling down and worshiping is inconsistent with angels who never receive worship. How do we know that? Revelation 22, verse 8. When John is writing, he says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me, but he said to me, you must not do that, exclamation point. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the word of this book, period, worship God, period. John falls in worship in front of this angel and he picks him up. He says, don't you dare do that because I am a servant of the living God. That's who you worship. Worship God. Secondly, army of the Lord here is used in a way that implies that the armies commanded our angelic armies. So this is a being who has and holds the authority to command angels. And thirdly, Joshua refers to the angel as my Lord. But most of all, the command to remove angels his sandals, which is a picture of our humanity, our sin in contact with a dirty world. So when Joshua heard this, he had to think of what we read in Exodus 3, 4, and 6, where God through the burning bush says to Moses, hey, take off your sandals. Where you stand is holy ground. Clear proof of the man standing before him was the voice from the burning bush that spoke to Moses. Angels don't make things holy. When the people came to the tomb and Jesus was gone and there was an angel there, he didn't say, take off your feet for this is holy ground. The one who makes things holy had risen and was God gone. But in the presence of God, we find holiness. And there's this command to, to shed his sandals because that spot was being made holy by God himself. And Joshua meets Jesus face to face. And in light of who Jesus is, Joshua immediately worships. Don't, don't miss the sequence of events here. He sees Jesus. He speaks to Jesus. He falls down in worship. And then after acknowledging the lordship of Jesus, Joshua asks, what is it, God, that you want me to do now? And we see this sequence of events over and over and over again in the pages of Scripture. Remember Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. He has this vision where he sees the Lord sitting on his throne in heaven. And he is thrust into this heavenly worship experience. And these angelic beings, these seraphim, are, are, are surrounding the throne saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. <laughs> and, and Isaiah, man, he worships and he says, woe is me, I'm full of sin. You're holy, I'm not. I'm a man of unclean lips. And, and God offers forgiveness. And after he worships, after he acknowledges who God is, what does Isaiah say? Here am I. Send me. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? Saul, while persecuting followers of Jesus, in Acts chapter 9, the, the beginning of Acts chapter 9 says the, the soul was breathing threats against the followers of Jesus. Jesus meets him. He falls to the ground in worship, and in response to the lordship of Jesus, he arises, and then he leaves to go serve him. The world would never be the same. And these stories and many others recorded in Scripture have a pattern. A person experiences Jesus, they worship Jesus, they surrender to Jesus, and then they ask God, what is it you want me to do now? If that's who you are, and this is who I am, and someone that great and that holy would love me and use me and offer me forgiveness, God, what is it you want me to do? I'll go. Let my life be used for a platform to display your might and your strength. And as Joshua feels his total inadequacy to handle the job that the Lord had called for him to perform, the man standing before him announced himself as the commander of the Lord's army and immediately took the pressure off of Joshua. And I'm sure it was with great relief that Joshua fell at his feet and worshiped him. I, 
I know, I, I know some of your names, and I know what some of your families are like, and I know what you order at the coffee shop, and, and, and I, I, I know some of you at a, at a certain level. But what I don't know and what I can't see is look into the depths of your heart and soul and see where you are in that progression. I can't look and see if, if you have or haven't come to that place where the, the truth and the reality of Jesus is standing before you and I can't see whether or not you've said, you're the Lord. You're the Lord. I'm gonna worship you. What does he want me to do? Because I'm gonna follow you. I'm gonna set myself apart. Audacious faith. With bold obedience, God, I'm going to give my life to you. But what I do know is this, that if you've never done that, man, you can do that tonight. You can come to Jesus and say, Jesus, this is who you are. And so I give my life to you. I'm going to surrender before you. I'm going to submit to you. I'm going to, I'm going to claim you as my Lord. Save me tonight. Redeem me tonight. Or maybe you've done that a long time ago, but the awe is gone and the worship is gone. And subsequently, because it has been numb and the truth of Jesus has become things we speak and we, and we just recite and we get in this pattern, the worship is stale and we've stopped saying, God, what is it you want me to do? And God, where is it you want me to go? Maybe, maybe your prayer with me tonight would be, Jesus, wake me up, Holy Spirit, move. God, let me see you for who you are. Shake me to the core. What is it you want me to do? What is it you want me to say? Where is it you want me to go? I'm yours or follow you. Or maybe you're like Joshua and Jericho is ahead of you and you just feel in over your head and the, the tasks that lie before you are greater than you can handle. Maybe you're fearful or apprehensive about the future. The same commander of the Lord's army that met Joshua in the shadow of Jericho wants to meet you tonight. And the question isn't, God, will you align yourself with me? But God, can I align myself with you tonight? See, Jesus is, is ready to go before you. He's ready to lead you into the promised land. And as Joshua, you need to bow before him and ask, what do you say to your servant? You need to surrender to the lordship of Jesus. And the moment you do, you can rest for the great task ahead is not your responsibility, but his. Scripture says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Let's pray tonight. God, we don't want to too quickly move away from the truth that we've heard and we've discovered in your word tonight. There are kids to be picked up next door. There are to-do lists waiting for us and homework to be done and kids to get in bed and all sorts of things that wait for us beyond this door. But we just want to rest in this moment. And Holy Spirit, let you bring the application for our hearts the application for our, our lives here in this moment. So we just open up, we say, God, how does he want me to change? How is it I can move closer to you tonight? What steps do you want me to take towards you, Jesus? God, we just thank you and we're gonna worship you for delivering us from our wander, delivering us from the slavery of sin, and ushering us into the promised land of redemption and salvation. What a good God you are. Renew the awe in us. Renew the wonder in us as we look at you, God. 